Hi, and thanks for joining me for another episode of Stephen Barry's Royal Secrets. Now, this is a vintage out of print book, and a lot of you just love the first episode. I really appreciated all your comments. Thank you so much. It's an affectionate romp behind the Green Bay's door. The Green Bay's door being the door that divides royal staff from the royal household, members of the royal family. And it's just a lovely book. I enjoyed reading it so much. Now, unfortunately, Stephen Barry did die a year year after this was published, he of course served as valet to the then Prince Charles for over 12 years. So he really does take us behind the scenes, but like I said, in a very affectionate way. So let's get on and let's get into another few chapters. Now in the next chapter, it's a telling about all the Queen's female staff, all the women that, you know, supported her in her role. And in particular, Bobo MacDonald, her nanny. Now, of course, Bobo MacDonald started as nanny when she herself was a young woman for the then Princess Elizabeth of York. And actually, Bobo's sister at a later date ended up looking after Princess Margaret. So she was a Scottish woman from very humble origins and the late Queen just absolutely adored her. And she went on to become a very close companion. She was such a valued member, such a valued part of the late Queen Elizabeth II's life. Now we can tell that Queen Elizabeth II just adored Scottish women. Nothing delighted her more than to go up to Balmoral and big busloads of Scottish women used to come along for 10 weeks of the year to help with all the house gets of Balmoral and attend the Gillies Ball. And you know, they played a really big role in the life of Balmoral. It gave them a little bit of fun. So this chapter says about that as well. Now, Stephen Barry, when he actually met Bobo MacDonald, by then she she was very looked after by the Queen. She was, like I said, more of a companion. She still used to go in and wake up the Queen every morning with her tea and biscuits, but she didn't really do any hard work anymore. She had her own car with her own chauffeur, and she used to go in and out of the front palace gate. And this is what Stephen Barry says about Bobo. A woman, Bobo MacDonald, holds what is probably the best job in the palace. Dresser, maid and confidant to the Queen. Margaret MacDonald is definitely high in the staff hierarchy. Nearly 80 now, she's always been a front gate person. <laughs> but these days she's driven through, I doubt if she's gone anywhere without a chauffeur for years. And then he goes on to say that she started off as a nanny to the then Princess Elizabeth of York. But I have to read you the bit about the um, Edinburgh women that used to come up to Balmoral to help. Among the characters who worked for the Queen, must, one must not forget the Edinburgh women. Come the 10 weeks holiday at Balmoral, extra staff members are needed for the house parties and to run the huge houses. The Edinburgh women come year after year, a busload of them, mostly widows, fat jolly ladies, for whom the 10 weeks of working for royalty is the treat of the year. Over the years, many of them have died, but their daughters take their places and then eventually their grandchildren. Now, he says a really funny thing about the Gillies Ball that would sort of herald the end of this stint up at Balmoral. The Edinburgh women are housed in Balmoral two to a room. They're not well paid. That's often said, isn't it, that... <laughs> Royal household staff are not well paid. You're supposed to just enjoy the experience, I think. Uh, but the pay helps the pensions and they have a lot of fun. To be fair, though, a lot of the in-house staff uh, have all their needs looked after. All their meals are made for them. Their laundry is taken care of. You know, they, they have free accommodation when they're at work. And um, they have the staff canteen and staff discounted drinks. And, you know, they have a pretty good wicket. So it's, you know. It's sort of, I guess the pay is in other perks. All the Queen's men and women enjoy the cachet of working for her, but how does she feel about them? And then he goes on to say, the truth of the matter, without their servants, most royals would be very lonely. That's a really poignant thing, isn't it? And I think at that point, he's actually talking about Bobo MacDonald in particular, because she was such, such a close companion to the Queen. 
Um, particularly as the Queen got older, she really relied on Bobo's companionship. And it's a really cute story that whenever the Queen's hairdresser used to attend to her, he would trot off down the hall and do Bobo McDonald's hair on his way out the door. So they ended up with almost exactly the same hair design, hairstyle. <laughs> and often she would end up with... Um, clothes from the Queen as well. If the Queen was getting a designer outfit made, often an extra one would be run up for Bobo. So I'll read you this thing about the Gillies Ball. They would have sing songs with them in the canteen, the staff, not the royal family. But they were all invited to the Gillies Ball, the highlight of their holiday, where they all arrived in a wash of polyester. <laughs> With their hair newly done, Prince Charles and Prince Philip made a point of dancing with them as many as possible. Both men enjoyed it, even if, as Prince Charles once remarked rather ruefully, it's like dancing with the marquee. Oh, Charles. <laughs> I bet it was, and I love that expression, a wash of polyester. Don't you? Now, in Chapter 3, Stephen Barry actually describes his rather good wicket, like I described, and this was his good wicket. I had my own rooms at the back of Buckingham Palace for the 12 years I was working for the then Prince Charles. I'm saying the then Prince Charles. He just says Prince Charles because obviously he's writing it at the time. And it overlooked 40 acres of superb garden, constant service, a housemaid to clean, footman to run errands. And if I needed a bottle of vodka from the canteen at cost price, he would get that. Meals cooked and a cheerful club in the shape of the bar at the canteen. And of course, it was a very good address. So he's obviously loving it. He's obviously really enjoying it. And he describes that how the Queen and Prince Philip couldn't wait to get away from Buckingham Palace at 2.30 every Friday afternoon. They had absolute horror of having to stay in London for the weekend. They always decamped to Windsor. And he describes how that would take place. On Friday afternoon at 2.30, they were off like a shot to Windsor Castle, which they considered their real home. And it's interesting the process of it, that um, even if guests would, you know, would come for dinner at Buckingham Palace, even if they were really close friends of the Queen and Prince Philip, they were never invited to stay. And the reason was that even though Buckingham Palace has hundreds, literally hundreds of rooms, there's only actually about 12 guest suites. And the only royal that really lived there was Prince Andrew. Now, I found this really interesting. When the Royal Standard comes down on a Friday afternoon, the Queen's 13-year-old rover draws away from the Privy Purse Gate to take her to Windsor. Now, the Queen's flag orderly's up on the roof and he stands by the flagpole waiting to see the rover drive off. He then lowers her standard. And that's the signal to everyone in the palace that the weekend has begun. Friday! Woo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> The Queen's gone, she's gone. <laughs> okay, let's party. But most people actually used to go off for the weekend. They didn't used to stay at Buckingham Palace because, and this is a direct quote, without the Queen, the vast musty building dies. With its endless corridors and underground passages, it becomes almost creepy. And there's only a skeleton staff of maintenance and security men until she arrives back on the Monday. And he says a really beautiful thing here. It is as if the building itself needs her presence. Isn't that a lovely thing to say? He says he has such obvious affection for the Queen. There is no question that the Queen is at the heart and hub of royalty. Everything revolves around her. And he says an interesting thing about Lady Diana Spencer. Until Prince Charles's wedding to Lady Diana Spencer, the Queen was undoubtedly the most popular woman in Britain. And then he says that the Queen was not jealous of Diana. The Queen has often been heard to say that now the princess has settled down, so she, obviously Diana was in a good phase, she's given royalty a fresh youthful image and that can only be for the good. In 1977, when the Queen held her Silver Jubilee celebration, she was astonished by the love and affection shown by her, to her by her people. And when you hear about her leaving for the Jubilee Thanksgiving service and how she departed Buckingham Palace that day, I found this really, really moving. Listen to this. 
The queen herself was almost bewildered when she left the grand entrance of the palace. Her staff, housemaids, footmen, pages, chefs were waiting to see her leave. They actually clapped and cheered as she appeared, breaking all the rules. Staff were both seen and heard in the palace on that day. Now, usually they would scurry away. If the queen was making her way to the entrance, she, you know, they would make the not seen, not heard but they actually lined, lined the halls and cheered and clapped her on the way out. I just think that is so moving and so beautiful. And listen to her reaction. This disregard for the rules absolutely delighted the Queen that day. She left the palace smiling and very happy. Oh. Oh, my heart, my heart. Now, it goes on to talk about the abdication of King Edward VIII and how if he had married someone and actually had children that the Queen wouldn't have become the Queen, although I doubt whether he would have ever had children, if you get my meaning. Anyway, um, he says that the Queen Mother used to make Margaret Rose and Elizabeth curtsy to their father. As soon as he became king, they had to curtsy to him. And she did that for a reason, because she wanted the children to become sharply aware of the majesty of the monarchy. And so they were made to treat their father as the monarchy, as the king first, father second. Now that remoteness and demand for respect did stay with the queen and she did sort of demand her due. She made sure that people did treat her respectfully and as a monarch. And But she could also be really warm and kind in private. That's what he says. And he says, she could not have been nicer to me. Among the true insiders, she was much more loved than the public's new darling, Princess Diana. Now I'm getting, I'm picking up the vibe, Stephen. I'm picking up the vibe. <laughs> Stephen Barry did not really get on with Princess Diana. I think there was obviously a pull for power. There was a bit of competition for, you know, Prince Charles's favour. And obviously the winner was Princess Diana, as it should be, because she was his wife. But the valet, you know, had to leave in the end. After about six months, he was pushed out the door. He got the message. So uh, he, she, he did say that nobody takes liberties with the Queen. And if someone does, she has a look that would freeze the sun. Now, this is a very telling remark. Listen to this one. Nobody but her immediate family would dream of calling her by her childhood name, Lilibet. Hear that, Harry? Hear that, Meghan? No one would, you know, dream. <laughs> In 1967, you'll remember, if you're not that old, you'll remember because you've seen old films on YouTube, that the BBC requested to make a film about the royal family and to follow them around very closely for about a year. Now, there's a lot of divided opinion about that. At the time, it was hugely popular. It was hugely popular. There's more of a backlash sort of in hindsight because people are saying it was at that point that the royal family lost their mystique. That was when, you know, all the trouble began because they sort of let people into the inner sanctum and they became a little too ordinary at that point. But at the time, do not underestimate the popularity of that documentary. It was huge. Huge. It was so popular. It sort of puts the Oprah Winfrey interview well in the shade. It, millions love that film. Millions. And there's funny stories he tells about the Piper. You know, they were waiting for the rain to stop. So the morning Piper up at Balmoral had to wait until 5 p.m. in order to have just enough light and just to have no rain and pretend he was doing the morning piping. And they had to rush off and change an outdoor clock at Balmoral so it looked like it was 7 a.m. in the in the morning then they had to turn the clock back and you know it did sort of cause a bit of ruckus all this filming and it sort of upset the staff quite a bit and he tells a funny story about you know the supposed boxes arriving at Balmoral for the Queen to actually look in them and he said it was true she used to work really really hard and she used to be inundated with cabinet papers but the boxes for some inexplicable reason on the film she opened it up and there was one letter in there. And he said, if you go to go to the trouble to fake the boxes arriving and everything, wouldn't you fill them up? 
Now, he talks about Royal Ascot Week and he says it was marvellous. And, of course, they're all at Windsor for Royal Ascot. And he talks about people staying and them all arriving in open carriages, driven down the centre of the course, while the magnificently dressed race goers line the rails and hang from their boxes to cheer, champagne glasses in hand. It all sounds very glamorous and very lovely. Now, he says that the four faithfuls always attend Ascot. Princess Margaret, the Queen Mother and Prince Charles. Now, Prince Philip couldn't abide horse racing and he would disappear at the back of the royal box and he had a little television set and he used to watch the cricket, which is funny. And he was saying about the glamour of Windsor. There was nothing cheap or tawdry at Windsor. There cannot be a grander house. It is the largest occupied castle in the world, and yet it manages to be surprisingly comfortable and very welcoming. And he says that Ascot Week was a real family time for the Queen. She wouldn't actually see a great deal of Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother sort of throughout the year. Not really. Uh, Royal Ascot Week was one of the times she really got to catch up with them, and they would have afternoon tea every day and they would giggle and have cakes and have lots of fun and he said that you know it would be cucumber sandwiches cakes scones everything one imagines of the English tea and then after Ascot week then the queen would go on a grapefruit diet because she was always trying to watch her weight now she he talks about a Captain Dornay who was one of the Queen Mother's godchildren. And I've never heard of this gentleman before. And he was one of the few that used to stay frequently at Buckingham Palace in one of the 12 suites. He used to treat it like a rather posh club. And the Queen was extremely fond of him and always dined with him if he was staying there. Dennis Dornay, a marvel to the staff because he seemed to have carte blanche with the royals. He was the perfect courtier, amusing, witty, and he knew how to sing for his supper. And his parents died when he was actually quite young and he was sort of adopted uh, by the Queen Mum and King George VI. So it's it's fascinating, isn't it, that he uh, was so close to the Queen, yet I had never heard about him. Maybe you had. He and Princess Margaret used to get on really well. She used to get all, his, all her sort of gossip about what was really going on out in the real world from Dennis. Then he says a really quite sad thing. Close friends are hard to come by for the royals. The older servants say that Prince Philip still misses Michael Parker. Michael Parker, of course, went off on that long trip on the Royal Yacht Britannia and Michael Parker's wife sued for divorce and, of course, that was when Michael Parker had to be dumped because it wasn't a good look. The royal court in those days did not accept divorced people. Prince Philip couldn't be seen to be palling around with a divorcee, so he got, you know, he got tossed, basically. Um, and it's pity because he says, Stephen Barry says that it did loosen up. Around the time that Stephen Barry was actually in court, it did loosen up. And he could tell that, you know, Prince Philip did miss having that really, really close friend. He said it's sad for him because the rules have gradually changed. Now, Princess Margaret is a prime example because she got divorced, of course, from Anthony Snowden. And Princess Michael of Kent had been divorced before she married her prince. Um, I actually forgot that. Of course, of course. Yes, Princess Michael of Kent was indeed a divorcee. And, oh, there was uh, Lord Harwood had a particularly public divorce. He was the Queen's cousin. He left the pianist, Marion Stein, to marry a young Australian girl, Bambi Tuckwell. <laughs> what a great name, Bambi Tuckwell. <laughs> And even the films shown at royal gatherings reflected the defender of the faith aspect of monarchy. So, you know, there was mindful about not having divorced people at court prior to everybody else within the family getting divorced, of course. And also this very sort of circumspect attitude to entertaining people that stayed at Windsor or stayed at the palace. Um, you know, they would have family friendly entertainment at all times. Now, you could actually get sacked from the royal household if you committed a crime or if you committed any sexual offences. And one young footman that Prince Philip particularly liked was found in bed with a young housemaid and he got the sack. And Prince Philip objected to that and said, why did he get the sack? Because Prince Philip was very painfully aware that most of the household was gay. <laughs> and he said, someone should have given him a medal, not sacked him. 
Now, he tells a funny story about one of the Meet the People lunches at Sandringham where, you know, they used to have these lunches and sort of popular uh, figures of the day, celebrities of the day, used to be invited for lunch to entertain the Queen and Prince Philip. And the Queen had a three-legged corgi called Heather. Now, one time at lunch at Sandringham, the opera singer guest Heather Harper was invited for lunch and the Queen bellowed at one point during the lunch, Heather, stop it, because Heather had got in amongst all the people's feet, this little three-legged corgi, and Heather Harper, the opera singer, jumped (laughs) to the roof because she thought that the Queen was actually telling her off. She sort of went bright red and looked at the Queen like, I'm sorry, ma'am, what have I done? Now, he says a really moving thing about the love between Prince Philip and the Queen. He saw love. And this is a direct quote. Onlookers see a great bond of affection between the Queen and her husband. I just saw love. They call each other darling, as do Prince Charles and Princess Diana, and they mean it. Now, I don't know whether he meant that Prince Charles and Princess Diana didn't mean it, but I know he means that you know, Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip do really mean it. Now, he goes on to talk about Prince Andrew. He says that he was a troublemaker ever since he was a little boy. When I was a nursery footman, he's still in trouble, but enormously likable. Now, this is the first person I've ever heard that has said that Prince Andrew is likable. I've never heard anyone else say that Prince Andrew is likable. I've always heard that he was arrogant and a pain in the butt, but no. No, Stephen Barry really likes him. Mabel Anderson, the nanny, would shout at him to put everything away when he would drag all the toys out and costumes out and things like that. And mutinous, lower lip thrust board, he would do as he was told. But when he wasn't looking, he would take a quick swipe at the corgis to relieve his feelings. Now, see, see, that is an indication that he's a bit yuck. I think. I think anybody that hurts animals in anger, yeah, I give them a wide berth. I give them a very wide berth. I will not give them the time of day. Prince Charles and Prince Andrew don't really get on too well. They've had an odd relationship with the prince trying to be a big brother and Andrew not responding. The staff didn't dislike Andrew, though they did resent him because, like I said, when the Queen went off to Windsor Friday afternoon at 2.30, often Andrew last minute would turn up at Buckingham Palace for the weekend and that would mean that staff would have to stay back even though they had plans for the weekend because he wouldn't give them enough notice. So he had that sort of arrogance where he just expected everyone to fit around him. And so they would have to cancel weekend plans. They wanted to see their family or they wanted to do something. So I understand that frustration. He, if he had have even given them 24 hours notice, it would have been better, but often it was very much late notice. Now he mentions Q Stark, so this is a bit juicy. There is an awful lot of Edward VII in Prince Andrew. He's indiscreet. He's written a great many letters to Q Stark, the young American soft porn actress with whom he took up. And we all know how that ended. And we all know that Prince Andrew actually broke up with her over telephone. Didn't even have the dignity. Now, they were really, really close. They were, I mean, there was talk of an engagement. And Prince Philip evidently stepped in and said, no, 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 not suitable, son, not suitable. And so rather than sort of meet her and break up with her in a dignified way, he just told her over the phone and then got the staff to block her calls. <sighs> Yeah, actually, no, he gave her the cold shoulder first and then eventually spoke to her on the phone and broke up with her. But he gave her the cold shoulder, markled her, markled her for a very long time. Now, the Queen had her mother-in-law living with her for a very long time, Princess Andrew of Greece, and she was, of course, the rather strange mother of Prince Philip and used to wear a nun's habit and used to smoke incessantly. Uh, The then little Prince Charles used to go up and visit her. She used to cough a lot, but evidently she had a very, she was an interesting conversationalist the little Prince Charles said, and he used to enjoy her bright and sharp mind. Um, He used to say, though, this is Stephen Barry, 
Uh, I must say that the Duke was not always pleasant to me, the Duke of Edinburgh. He was not an easy man. There was a restlessness about him which came from a very unsettled childhood. So he's very understanding about it. He was obsessed with being manly. The word macho could have been coined for the Duke. And he used to sort of really demand that of Charles. He used to really demand that he showed his macho side. Now, in the early 70s, Charles was very macho. He used to have um, a a book, I've got a book, an old vintage book, which was all sort of uh, very much the action man, flying helicopters and playing polo and doing all these, you know, rare and uh, dangerous things and being on a minesweeper, captain of a minesweeper for the Royal Navy and all that sort of thing. So he was very manly, but his father kept sort of demanding more, more, more. Um, now, after Lord Mountbatten was actually killed, the prince started going to his father for advice and they had very differing reactions to the death of Lord Mountbatten. Uh, the Prince Charles went off down by the river and was obviously upset, obviously teary, obviously needing to compose himself, whereas Prince Philip was very much, well, we don't show our emotions and we don't carry on and, you know, smarten yourself up and get over it and we have to be strong and... And Stephen Barry felt really, really sorry for Prince Charles at that point. He thought that he probably needed just a jolly good hug from his dad at that point. Now, there's a funny story just to finish off. The Bill Holloway, the Duke of Edinburgh's in man, um, his page, uh, he really didn't have a lot to do. When the Duke of Edinburgh was away, uh, he didn't have a lot to do. He used to actually prop up the bar and the staff canteen and take it pretty easy. But when Prince Philip was in residence, no one worked harder. He was run off his feet, literally run off his feet because the Duke of Edinburgh was so demanding, so demanding. Well, there's a funny story that Prince Philip brought in time and motion study people and Bill Holloway was petrified that he would... <laughs> He found out that he didn't really do a lot when uh, the Duke of Edinburgh was away on one of his many, many trips. But luck would have it that he heard that Prince Philip was coming back to the palace for seven days. So straight away, Bill Holloway rang up the time and motion people and said, would you like to observe me in my job over the next week? Because you'll get a really good idea what I really do because Prince Philip is in residence. So sure enough, he was literally run off his feet, run off his feet. Whereupon, if the prince then went away for eight to 10 weeks, he would do nothing. Absolutely nothing except go and drink at the staff canteen, like I said. Well, the time and motion people were so impressed by how hard Bill Holloway actually worked when Prince Philip wasn't in residence that when they filed their final report, they recommended that Bill Holloway get his own assistant. So he worked out that little scam rather well, don't you think? I'll be back to tell you more tales from this wonderful book in about a week's time and I'll see you then. Bye.